Well, good evening and welcome to a Bible study with us here at Grace Point Church. I'm Stephen Geiger. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Point. We're so glad you're joining us tonight. We're in a series uh, of the Psalms of Ascent. And it's especially uh, fitting because this Sunday morning we're going to be regathering here on campus. We know a lot of our folks are going to continue to join us online. And uh, we're going to continue to live stream Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, as long as, uh, as, as into the future as we can see. But this Sunday morning, June the 7th at 10 a.m., we are going to be open on campus for worship. We're encouraging people who are vulnerable to the virus because of age or health conditions or otherwise to be safe and stay home and connect and join and worship with us online. But uh, if you are here this Sunday, remember, we're going to be practicing social distancing. We're going to be wearing masks in the building. And uh, so I know this is going to be an adjustment. It's going to be, I'm sure, frustrating. And uh, so just be prepared and and just be filled with the Spirit and have patience. And uh, we're going to all get through this together. So we want to encourage you. Pastor Paul is having a little work day this Saturday morning at 8 a.m., so anybody wants to come down, we're going to do some work outside, we're going to do some cleaning inside, just as a way of kind of getting ready for, uh, for this Sunday. So if you want to come and join us, um, you can come Saturday morning at 8 a.m. For a, for a special work day for a few hours, and, uh, and then Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And um, tonight we're going to continue uh, our study of the Psalms of Ascent. You know, when we first closed the church uh, for gatherings... Um, the first thing I did on the first Wednesday night after we we stopped meeting publicly, physically, was we taught the Psalms of Lament. There's so many Psalms where David and others cry out to God in grief and in difficulty and disappointment. One of the things I love about the Psalms, in fact, you can read five Psalms a day, and every month you'll read through the book of Psalms, 150 chapters. A lot of people read one proverb and five Psalms every day, Um, because that'll take you through them over and over again throughout the year. But I love the Psalms because they're so emotive. They're so personal. It's people really crying out to God. They're songs. They're prayers. And so it's people really hearing from God and talking to God. And it, it shows how God wants us to be honest about how we feel. There's Psalms of excitement and praise and celebration. There's also songs of distress and and psalms of of lament and grief. So we began by looking at Psalm 46. It says, God is our refuge, our our strength, he's our help, an ever-present help in trouble, that we can be still and know that he is God. And so we began this whole season of the coronavirus with the psalm of lament, and the reality that when we're down and when we're hurting, that we we can call on the Lord and he will be with us. And now we come... Uh, These last couple Wednesday nights, we've been talking about the songs of ascent. These are psalms that were sung and prayed when the children of Israel were marching in pilgrimage, making their way to Jerusalem, especially three specific times a year when they would go for three very special festivals. Now, there were seven Jewish feasts that the Old Testament uh, talks about, but there were three that were like Christmas, Easter, and Good Friday all rolled into one, where every able-bodied male was required to come to Jerusalem and participate in these feasts. So from all the towns and villages, families would make their way. And Jerusalem was on a, a hilltop, and so they're called the Songs of Ascent because the people would sing and pray and repeat these words to God and to each other as they were ascending and making their way up to a higher place, to an elevated place. They were also psalms that were often prayed and and recited by the priests when they would walk up those 15 steps uh, to the temple. And there are 15 psalms of ascent. They're from Psalm 120 to 134. Now, what I've done over this study these last couple weeks is we looked at those three major feasts that people were heading towards. First, there would be Passover and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so we talked about a picture of Christ and the redemption, the salvation that he offers us. That's like the Passover to the Old Testament, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how like unleavened bread, he's taken all the sin out of our lives, that we can be clean and holy and pure 
before him. And so we looked at salvation. And then last week, we talked about Pentecost and the Feast of Weeks. Now, the word Pentecost literally means 50, and the feast, the festival of weeks, would be 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. And it was a, 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 a festival of celebration and gratitude for the harvest that God had provided. And we saw that just as Passover and unleavened bread is a picture of Christ and his salvation and redemption, last week we saw that the Feast of Weeks and the Pentecost and the harvest was a beautiful picture in the New Testament on Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and now Peter stands up and preaches this incredible sermon and um, 3,000 people are saved and it's showing that now God's harvest is not about grain, it's not about wheat, it's not about agriculture, but it's a spiritual harvest, it's a harvest of souls. Instead of harvesting grain, now we're harvesting men and women boys and girls, young people, people, the souls of men that God is bringing in to the, to, to the harvest. And the Bible says that those who sow in tears reap in songs of joy. Those who go out mourning, they come in uh, celebrating with bringing in the sheaves. And so he's saying that um, the first festival celebrated salvation. The second festival is a picture of the harvest and the, the ministry of the church and the age of grace sharing the gospel and bringing people to Christ. Now tonight, we're going to look at three specific psalms, Psalm 132, 133, and 134, that I believe clearly were, will, will correlate and correspond to that third festival that was so important. And this was the festival or the Feast of Tabernacles. Now sometimes in the Old Testament, it's called the Feast of Booths but it's the Feast of Tabernacles. What does that mean? When they would go to, the, to Jerusalem for this specific uh, celebration, all of the people would stay outside the city in like little huts, like tents. So in other words, the same way that all across the southeast and all across the country during football season, people pilgrimage in their RVs uh, to big fields where they sit there on Friday night and all day Saturday, and then Saturday night they watch a college football game where a field is turned into like a makeshift campground. The same kind of thing, the, the, the people of Israel would go to Jerusalem and every family, they would have the Day of Atonement, and then for seven days, they would stay in huts. Often these huts or tents would be covered with palm branches. And what they were doing was the Feast of Tabernacles was a reminder and a celebration of how God had provided and protected his people through their wilderness wandering, how God had tabernacled with them. You remember they used to have a tabernacle, which was essentially like a portable or mobile temple or synagogue. And so in those days of wilderness wandering, they were, they were, they were learning to dwell with God and to, to live with him. And it's a beautiful picture of the human condition of life, that, that life's a journey and it's filled with all kinds of obstacles and difficulty. And so the Feast of Tabernacles, if you get that picture, if you can imagine if we had a weekend where we told everybody at Grace Point, hey, we want everybody to come to church, not for a service, but we want you to stay for seven days. We're all going to meet down here on Saturday, and we're going to set, every family is going to set up their own tent out in the field, and we're going to live here together for seven days. Can you imagine what that would be like? And so it's, it's really a beautiful picture of life with Christ and, and our life uh, with the Lord, and the idea that not the same way that Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a picture of our salvation, and that Pentecost and the Feast of Weeks is a picture of our life and ministry in Christ and through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. The Feast of Tabernacles is a beautiful picture of heaven, and that one day the dwelling of God will be with men, and we will be with him and we will live together forever and ever. Listen to what he says, first of all, in Psalm 132, and let's begin in verse 13. Psalm 132, verse 13. Listen to what it says. For the Lord has chosen Zion. Now, underline that word Zion, or think about that. This is used 150 times in the Bible. And Zion 
<clears throat> literally was Mount Zion. Remember I told you Jerusalem was built on a hilltop. And so Zion is synonymous. It's a euphemism for the city of Jerusalem. So Psalm 132 verse 13 says, God has chosen Zion. He's chosen Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's also a, a euphemism for his people. And so oftentimes the Old Testament church, Israel, is referred to as Zion. He has desired it for what? What does God want? What did God choose Zion, Jerusalem, Israel for? Look at what it says in verse 13. He has desired it for his dwelling. His dwelling. I can't imagine that this would not have been a psalm that they would have been thinking and praying and singing as they were heading toward the Feast of Tabernacles, celebrating God's dwelling in them and with them and, uh, and for us, in us and with us and for us. Skip down to Psalm 133. Psalm 133, only three verses. It says how good, how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Once again, it's this, this theme, this motif of dwelling and living, residing together in unity. So he said, God chose Zion. He desired it for his dwelling. It says now, listen, it's wonderful. It's, ble it's a blessing when God's people, when brothers live together in unity. And then look at verse uh, 2 and 3. It says it's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even what? Even life evermore. So what is it all about? It's about life evermore Brothers living together in unity, it's good, it's pleasant, it's a blessing. And so the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated that one day, the same way that the children of Israel met in, in the wilderness and followed God, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, staying in tents and, and tabernacling with God, the same way that the, the Old Testament Jews celebrated that at the Feast of Tabernacle one day, God is going to bring uh, uh, him, himself. Jesus is going to come. He's going to reign on the earth. And when history is culminated, we're all going to live with him forever. And the dwelling of God will be with men. And he will be their God. And they will be his people. So notice in Psalm 132, it introduces Zion, which is Jerusalem. Psalm 133, he talks about God's people living together. And when he describes the blessing of unity and fellowship among God's people, fellowship in the church, it, uh, he, he describes it as oil running down over, over the head and into the beard. And if you're like me, you would probably say, well, the idea of somebody pouring oil on my head and running all over and getting my clothes dirty, and that would be weird and sticky, and I wouldn't really like that. But the, the Old Testament picture here is the anointing of the priest. And the priests would have this oil, this anointing oil poured over their head. And it's a beautiful symbol of the, the, the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit, God's presence, how the priest was anointed because he was being set apart for God. And so that Old Testament picture of the anointing, remember in the New Testament, we are all priests. We're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood, that we are, we are a kingdom of priests, that every believer is a priest. We call that doctrine the priesthood of the believer. And so he's saying it's, it's such a rich blessing. First of all, Zion, and then secondly, God's people. And then finally, look at Psalm 134. Once again, just three quick verses. Psalm 134, he says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister. The King James famously says, Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord, who serve, who minister in the house of the Lord. Look at verse 2. He says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord, bless the Lord. Look at verse 3. May the Lord bless you from Zion. He who is the maker of heaven and earth. 
Now, if you have something to write with, I want you to just jot down three simple phrases tonight as we think about these psalms of ascent, as we prepare our hearts for worship and for for being in God's presence, recognizing that the worship of God and the house of God and the church of God, it's not about brick and mortar. It's not about buildings. Friends, the reality is there's going to be people here this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. physically that are going to gather in this room and worship. There's going to be a lot of people that are part of our church family that are not going to be here. The church is not about a building. It's about the assembly, the congregation. It's about being a part of God's family. And so as we think about these Psalms of Ascent, I want you to think about three phrases. Just write this down as you think about what the Feast of Tabernacles and what these Psalms, 132, 133, 134, what they say to us about the dwelling of God with us what it means that he lives and he resides in us. Remember in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. But in the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. The Spirit of God does not reside in this building at 5590 Northeast 6th Avenue. The Spirit of God indwells every person who knows Christ as Savior. Everyone who names the name of Christ and has received Christ as Savior, we are all priests and we are all the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God, what what did God choose Israel for? Psalm 132, verse 13. What was God's design? What was his desire? Psalm 132, verse 13. The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for what? For his dwelling. See, he wants to tabernacle with you. God wants to live in you. He wants to live with you. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And the same way that in the Old Testament, Aaron the priest would have oil poured over his head and going down his body for all to see in the same way God wants the Holy Spirit to so penetrate our lives and saturate our souls that that, that that anointing, that his power and presence over us and in us and through us, we would recognize that we are priests and that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if you have something to write with, jot this down. Number one, Psalm 132 speaks of God dwelling and his presence, first of all, in the city of God. What was Jerusalem? Jerusalem was the city of God. Let me give you some scriptures um, that you can jot down. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read through all of these, but as you think about what it means that, that Zion, that Jerusalem is the city of God, Write this down, Hebrews 11, verse 10. Hebrews 11, verse 16. Psalm 46, verses four and five. Psalm 48, verses one through three. All of those verses speak of Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of God. Augustine, the great theologian, wrote his famous book, The City of God. And it's talking not about geography, but it's talking about theology, that we are all a part of God's family and he wants to live in us and with us and through us by his Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, the word Zion in the, in the scripture is interesting because it literally means fortification. Oftentimes the Old Testament Psalms would speak of the Lord being our refuge. He's our fortress. Martin Luther famously penned the words, a mighty fortress is our God. God is our refuge, our deliverer, our fortress. In those days, they didn't have patriot missiles. How did they defend themselves? They built their cities with fortified walls, and they would often build those cities on top of a hill so they could see danger coming and they could protect themselves. The city of God is a picture of God's protection and provision for us. Zion means fortified, a fortress, a fortification. It means raised up. 
It's a, the city of God is a picture of God's protection and provision for you and for me, for his church. That he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. He desires to dwell with us. But in Psalm 133, we don't just see that he's talking about the, that they're praying and they're singing and they're celebrating the city of God, but look at this picture. In Psalm 133, he's talking about the people of God. Write that down. The city of God and the people of God. How good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, in love, and in unity. I'm going to tell you, we are living in interesting days. I'm convinced that, uh, that our nation is divided. Our nation is divided culturally. Our nation is divided politically. Our nation is divided economically. <clears throat> We've got all these different reasons that we're different from other people and we're separated and segregated. If, if not legally, we're segregated practically speaking. We're segregated in neighborhoods. We're segregated in churches so many times. We're segregated economically. You know, there's a lot of people of wealth who never touch a person of, of meager means, you know? There's a lot of people that are poor that they've never been in the home of a millionaire. Uh, did you know one of the great things about Grace Point Church is that you can have uh, people that are well-to-do and financially secure and independent and free sitting next to homeless people? That's one of the best things about the church of Jesus Christ, that God doesn't see all those superficial uh, distinctions. In Christ, there's neither male nor female. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. In other words, God is saying, hey, listen, black, white, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, everything in between, right-handed, left-handed, listen, young, old, God just cares about people. God loves people more than anything. And listen to what it says in Psalm 133, verse 1. How good, how pleasant it is when God's people, when brothers, literally, brothers, live together in unity. And I'm going to tell you, this is a beautiful opportunity for our church and for the church to show the world how to live in unity, how to love one another how to be patient with one another, how to care for one another. Listen, if you get enough human beings together, you're gonna have differences of opinion. You get enough people together, you're gonna have some conflict. I don't know about your house, but my house has lots of conflict. Conflict in and of itself is not unhealthy. Conflict doesn't destroy marriages. Conflict doesn't destroy relationships between parents and kids. Conflict doesn't end friendship. Unresolved conflict ends relationships. Unresolved anger, unresolved conflict destroys churches. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Unresolved conflict will destroy communities. It will destroy our nation. Abraham Lincoln famously said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And can I tell you something that, I don't know, this, this may be provocative, it may be controversial, it may make you mad at me, I'm just going to say it, okay? When you get to heaven, if you go to heaven and you're with the, in the presence of God and you find out that your political enemy is also there. Are you going to get mad and want to go to hell because you don't want to spend eternity with your political enemies? If you get to heaven and you find out that there's going to be some rich people there and you thought that, that rich people were all evil, uh, are you going to get mad and want to go to hell because there's going to be some people there that were rich? Are you going to be upset if there's a poor person there? Are you not going to want to sit by them uh, in worship because they don't look like you or they don't dress like you. I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying. I'm not saying that in heaven there are going to be these distinctions. I'm just making the point that, friends, 
when Jesus called his disciples, you know who some of his disciples were? One of Jesus' disciples was Matthew the tax collector, and another disciple was Simon the zealot. Now, do you know what a tax collector and a zealot was? It it was the equivalent of one guy wearing a Make America Great Trump hat and the other guy carrying around his Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matter poster. And yet Jesus called people from these extremes of the political and cultural divide, and he had the same message for both of them. He said, follow me. I'm going to tell you, when God dwells in us and with us and through us, when the Holy Spirit is at work in us, one of the beautiful things we can show the world is how to love people and how to be agreeable with people that you don't have to agree with. You know, you can disagree without being disagreeable. And one of the things that our church needs to model for our community and for one another is love for people and humility and a willingness to listen to one another. You know, not everybody is going to agree about when and how to reopen the church. Not everyone agrees about what kind of music we sing. Not everybody agrees about how long the sermon should be. I mean, when you get enough human beings together, you're going to find differences of opinion. And can I tell you, when, when you get three or four people together and you get different opinions, you know what you get? You get better decisions. Because as you listen to different opinions, it protects you. It's like a jury. Twelve people rarely get it wrong. That's the beauty of the American jury system. Listen, 12 people usually get it right. When you get 12 people together in a room from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life, you've got all those perspectives there. Listen, if I'm ever on trial for my life, I don't want to be standing before some judge with their preconceived ideas, their personal biases, their background and experience. I want 12 people so that everybody's opinion counts and everybody's opinion matters. And so when we think about the city of God, we remember that God desired a people that he could live with, that he could fellowship with. When we think about the people of God in Psalm 133, we think about the value of unity. And can I tell you, I've said this a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. Write this down. There is nothing uglier than the church at its worst. There's nothing uglier than the church at its worst. But there is nothing more beautiful than the church at her best. How good and how pleasant it is to when brothers and Christian God's people live together in unity. We need to prize and we need to treasure and we need to protect the unity of our church. Unity does not mean conformity. Unity doesn't mean that we all have to take a loyalty oath. And anybody who disagrees with Pastor Stephen is in sin. That's nonsense. That's like a cult. That's spiritual abuse. Unity says, listen, we have leaders. The pastor leads, but the majority rules. And that's the way we work here at Grace Point Church. The pastors lead, but the majority rules. And we need to remember the the unity that we have in the gospel. Uh, Psalm 132 talks about the city of God. Psalm 133 talks about the people of God. But Psalm 134 speaks of the house of God. I love that phrase. Come bless the Lord, you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place, in the sanctuary. Now you remember that when, when, the, when Israel would sing this song, they were thinking of the temple. They couldn't wait to get to Jerusalem. They couldn't wait to be together. And as much as I'm excited and happy that we're going to be gathering here physically this Sunday morning, that's not the interpretation of these verses. 
It's not talking about how great it is that we can all come together and be back in this building under this roof and worshiping God as if somehow this place is more holy or sacred than any place else. If you're sitting uh, on your porch looking at an iPad or you're somewhere looking at your phone or you're at home on your computer or on your television and you're joining us for worship, the, the, the heart of this is that we're gathering together as believers with encouragement, with accountability, with opportunities to serve and we have an opportunity to bless and praise the Lord. And it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter how you vote, it doesn't matter what your net worth, it doesn't matter what language you speak, <clears throat> all that matters is if you're a human being created in the image of God, Jesus Christ died on the cross because of his unbelievable, unconditional, incredible, supernatural love for you. And it's not where we've come from that connects us. It's where we're going to. And I want to I turn your attention as we close to this incredible passage. Skip over to Revelation chapter 21. In your Bible, turn to Revelation 21. We're going to read the first four verses. And then I want to skip down for just a moment. And I want to look at um, uh, verses 22 and 23. But look at Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. And I want you to think about it in the context of what we've just read about the city of God and being in God's presence, the people of God enjoying the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and the bond of love, and the house of God being this house of prayer, this house of mercy, this house of worship. For, the neighbor, for our neighbors and for the nations, the church of God. Listen to what he says in Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the city of God, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. You've got the city of God, you've got the people of God, the church, the bride of Christ. Look at verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, the house of God, God's dwelling place. Now the, you've seen the city of God, the people of God, and the house of God. God's dwelling is now among the, the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. You realize that, that poverty is, is not going to exist in heaven. Do you realize that depression and anxiety is not going to exist in heaven? Do you realize that, that sickness and suffering and death is not going to it? You say, Pastor Stephen, how can you believe in a God who's all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful? How can you believe in this incredible God that would create this mixed-up, messed-up, broken world? that we live in. Can I tell you something? <clears throat> One day, he's going to make this a brand new world. And the old order of things is going to pass away. And listen, you're not going to need hand sanitizer in heaven. And nobody's going to wear masks in heaven. And there's not going to be Kleenex in heaven. There's not going to be intensive care units in heaven. There's not going to be tears. There's going to be no Kleenex in heaven. Why? Because the dwelling of God will be with men and he will be their God and they will be his people. The city of God, the people of God, the house of God, <clears throat> it's like a tabernacle. It's where God lives. Can I tell you, oftentimes people want to talk about heaven and they look at particular Bible verses and they want to know where heaven is. 
And they want to know, do you believe literally that the, the heaven is a cube? And then when you read Revelation and when you read this, do we need a measuring tape when we start talking about heaven? Can I tell you what makes heaven heaven is God is there. And I'm going to tell you, when I get to heaven, if I find out I was wrong about something that I thought the Bible taught when I was here on earth, if I get to heaven and I'm in the presence of God and I find out I was wrong about something, I'm not going to get mad and ask to go to hell because I'm going to be so mad I was wrong. Listen, when you get in the presence of God, all that is going to matter is that you are living with him. And then finally, look at what it says in verses 22 and 23. Verses, Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23. He said this, I didn't see a temple in the city. Isn't that interesting? Do you think you have to come to Grace Point Church to worship? Well, you, you're not going to because guess what? There's not going to be a temple in heaven, in the New Jerusalem. He says, I didn't see a temple in the city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Isn't that beautiful? The city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Listen, when we get to heaven, we're not going to need a church building, and we're not going to need anybody to turn the lights on. I'm sure that's going to be good news for Pastor Paul and Michael Brown and Mike Landreth, that they're not going to be running all over heaven with brooms and mops and screwdrivers. Listen, <clears throat> when you get to heaven, there's not going to be a building, and there's not going to be a light switch. There's just going to be the presence and the glory of God forever. And friends, that is what's going to make heaven, heaven. The Psalms of Ascent prepare us for the presence of God. They remind us of the unity of the fellowship. And they convince us, they emphasize the, the spirit and, and the idea that one day, we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's bow our hearts together and pray. Father, thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for this book that we can hold in our hands. Father, this incredible privilege to have the book of God, to have your word to us. We thank you so much that you inspired this word, that, Lord, you preserved it down through the centuries. And even now, as we read and listen and we look to your word, that not only have you inspired it, not only have you preserved it, but in this moment, your spirit is our teacher and you will illuminate it and you'll, you'll show us your truth. Father, help us as a church Lord, to be all about sharing the gospel so that everyone can live in your presence forever. God, help us to be a church that prizes and values the unity of our fellowship. That, Lord, we are humble enough that we can learn from one another. That, Lord, that you would fill us with love for each other that we could enjoy and appreciate the differences, the different gifts, even the different backgrounds that we come from. And that, Lord, nothing we say or do would be a stumbling block to someone in our community or in this world coming to faith in Jesus Christ. God, help us to be good citizens. Help us to be good neighbors, especially in these days of difficulty. And Lord, continue to give our leadership uh, wisdom uh, as we move forward into the uncertainty of what's before us. And Lord, we're just going to trust you one day at a time, one step at a time, even one moment at a time, uh, at a time, just to follow after you. Thank you that your house is not, uh, it's not uh, 
material, but your kingdom is spiritual. It's not of this world. And Lord, it's available to everyone who will come to you in faith and repentance. Lord, we love you. We praise you tonight. Thank you for the joy and the blessing and the privilege of being a part of your family. And we thank you that it's a forever family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you for being with us. You can go to gracepoint.net and you can click on the word giving in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and you can continue to give and, and support the ministry of Grace Point Church. And we're just so excited about how God has been so faithful. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. And I know for many, it's sacrificial uh, giving, even when there's difficulty and uncertainty with businesses and jobs and all the things that are going on. Thank you so much for being so faithful. And uh, we're just trusting God one day at a time. Hope to see some of you Saturday morning at 8 a.m. to help clean up and get ready for Sunday. Sunday morning at 10, if you're here, be sure to bring your mask be prepared for social distancing. Uh, we'll have some announcements and things up that'll give you instruction. You should have gotten an email blast yesterday that gives you some of the details about what we're gonna do. But I uh, wanna encourage you uh, to remember that you can join us live online on this YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, put Grace Point Church Fort Lauderdale. Do me a favor tonight. If you haven't already, would you subscribe to our YouTube channel right now? Just below the screen, there's a little thumbs up. You can click on that and you can like us. And the more likes and the more subscribers we get, the better we're able to get the word out about our channel and about Grace Point. So help us do that if you would. If we can pray for you or help you in any way, send me an email. Just send it to pray at gracepoint.net. We want to stay connected with you. We've just started a brand new summer Bible reading plan. We're reading the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, so we just started uh, yesterday. So today was chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Tomorrow's chapter 3. We're going to be reading a chapter of 1 Corinthians for the next uh, couple weeks. And this Sunday morning, I'm starting a brand new series of messages for the whole summer that's going to correspond with our reading plan. We're going to go through all 13 letters of the Apostle Paul. This Sunday morning, we're going to be in Romans, his magnum opus, and uh, his incredible book about God's amazing grace. So I hope you'll join us Sunday morning, either on campus or online, 10 a.m. for You Had Me at Hello. And uh, join us in reading 1 Corinthians this week, and uh, we look forward to being with you Sunday and next Wednesday night right here at 7 p.m. God bless you, and uh, have a great week.